So welcome everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to, for me to introduce our guest this week, Andy Phelps. Um, you may have noticed there were back-to-back game-related things. That was not planned at all. That was sort, sort of random. Um, it won't, uh, but there won't be, if, you, if you're not a games, if games are not one of your primary interests, don't worry, they don't show up for the next 10 weeks. So. Just happened to be the last two weeks. Um, so Andy is a, a longtime uh, friend and colleague. We were just reminiscing that we, I guess the GLS, like two, maybe the second time we had the Games Learning Society Conference, um, which is GLS. Um, uh, Andy was a, a reformed guild leader um, who was presenting with Constance uh, Steinkuber, faculty here, most of you know, on, uh, was it the guilt of the guild leader? That the talk was? Um, yeah, which, so if you're interested in that, he won't be talking about that today, but he does have a whole s chapter of his life as a competitive uh, EverQuest guild leader, I remember EverQuest, yeah. Um, since then, um, as you can see from the introduction, he was a founding director of um, the uh, School of Interactive Games and Media at RIT, of the Magic Center. Um, he's really been one of the leading uh, games educators and games researchers for the past 15, 20 years. Um, he's going to tell you more about his biography in the, in the context of the talk, so I won't say more. But it's a real treat to have Andy here, and thanks for coming. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Kurt. Um, yeah. Okay, let's do this thing. Uh, I have overprepared like way, way, way too much content for the amount of time I have, so I will go kind of fast and then skip some, and we'll see where that goes. Uh, so my apologies in advance for that, but that's what I always do. Um, so today's talk is a little bit about me, so you have some context of the things I'm trying to say, um, some lived experience in building a program and a center and a building and hopefully a piece of a field. Um, and then a little bit about the games I make and the kind of where I think we should focus some energy looking in the future. We'll see. Uh, hopefully through all of that you get some sense of me, some sense of the field, that I've, the ways that I've been engaged with the field, a little bit about what's happened in the field over the course of, of all of that. Um, and yeah, and that's me on a rock in New Zealand. I got back from New Zealand two weeks ago. It's very pretty. You should go. All right, uh, so hi, my name is Andy. The reason I'm a gamer is that my best friend Julie Myers got an Atari when I was like four. Um, and then we hung out at her house for the next decade. Um, and that's pretty much how that went. And I make things. Um, that would, that's kind of the way that I would choose to introduce myself as a maker of things. Because um, that's where I find fun and passion and engagement. And the kinds of things that I make um, tend to go back and forth between art and computing, or art and development, or art design and code, or however you want to think about that division, the way that we chop a line through it in academia, you know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, so I've struggled a lot with where and how to fit within academics, because there are multiple potential homes, but none of them feel quite like home. Um, so it's a little strange. Um, and it, when I was an undergrad, I was doing computer-generated work like that, and I was also doing traditional paint and models, um, which kind of weirds people out that someone would choose to do both of those things. So I built a games program uh, it's from some really, really humble beginnings. So uh, I started on the faculty at, at RIT in 1999, and um, my students almost immediately started coming up to me saying, uh, we want to do video games. And I was like, okay, this class is not about video games. And I said, but we want to do video games because they had figured out somewhere that I had freelanced in undergrad to sort of pay for bills with some games companies. And I thought about it for a little while and I was like, well, you know, I'm teaching people like introductory programming. Why don't we just make a video game then? Like, it's as good as any other project to learn introductory programming, so we'll just go with it. Um, and so the New York Times showed up and covered my course. And that was very strange um, because <laughs> I don't know if anybody else remembers when they were like an assistant professor in the audience, but you did not have the time showing up taking pictures of your courses. And it was on the front page of the business section of the New York Times. And my mom saw it before I did and was like, what the hell are you doing in your career? And I was like, I don't really understand what's happening. And that was very, it was odd. And when I look back at that, like RIT is a very, it's a private school. It's about 20,000 students. It's a very, very engineering-centric school, right? It has other majors and stuff, but like the, the core of its cultural identity is engineering. And it's also a very applied school. 
And there was this kind of culture war that I had joined the faculty in the middle of because a few years before I got there in the 90s, the computer science department had fractured into uh, computer science and software engineering and information technology around an argument about um, application, right? And so uh, the folks in CS, the, the core folks in CS had said that it's a theoretical <coughs> discipline and they wanted to focus that way. The folks in IT had said they wanted to focus on business applications and serving, you know, kind of the Fortune 500 um, needs of um, both human-computer interaction as well as uh, kind of networking and systems and stuff like that. Um, and then the software engineering folks wanted to take sort of a more proce engineering process-oriented view towards how software gets built. So they kind of split into three departments. I joined IT because I thought application was where I sort of fit because I was doing art, um, which you know, it doesn't really ring true to anything, but it felt that way at the time. Um, and so I was someone with an art background developing a master's degree in a college of computing and information sciences. I was running around pretty scared as a junior faculty member trying to figure out what I was doing. Um, and I wound up building a thing around students that wanted to make video games by trying to teach them a little bit of everything and then letting them run off and specialize in something deep. So uh, sort of the T-shaped educational model if you're into that vernacular. Um, so you fast forward a little bit, and it's been a pretty wild ride ever since then. Um, so I taught that first course in 2000, 2001. Uh, I helped the students build the club in 2002. That course became a concentration in 2003. We launched a graduate degree in 2006, an undergraduate degree in 2007. I had to become a department chair uh, because once you have degrees, you need a department to run them. Uh, universities are funny that way. Um, so people would come to the U and say, you know, how many students do you have? And our existing department couldn't figure it out because they didn't know how many were in this major versus this major when they're taking the same cross-listed course and all this kind of stuff. Um, <coughs> then we made a minor, uh, and then in 2013 was a kind of a big departure. I moved away from administration of the school and into creating a university research center, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, called Magic and an associated studio. And then in 2016, we raised about $30 million for that initiative and built a new building on campus, which will open in a week. Uh, and then also in 2016, I convinced the state of New York that we should be designated a games hub, which is sort of a recurring funding, large scale grant thing. Um, and then we started doing the, started hosting the New York State Games Challenge for the entire state of New York at, through that hub. Um, so that's why I sound a little tired. <laughs> nothing to do with New Zealand. And I would say about that, um, if you look, if I look back on that, right, I think one of the things that was interesting was that we were trying to build what is essentially a content degree, a culture degree. We were trying to solve cultural problems, not necessarily technical problems. And so when we built, we first built that degree, uh, it was still like early 2000s. Games were much more console driven than they are today. Um, the industry was a little more monolithic than it is now. And so I went out and talked to all the major studios and I said, who do you hire students from? Because if we're gonna build a degree, we need to ensure that students have career opportunities uh, when, they, when they graduate. And they universally told me just about the same thing, um, which was, well, we hire from all the best CS schools. So we hire from MIT and we hire from Stanford and we hire from uh, Cornell, and we hire from, you know, this, that, and the other. And I said, okay, well that, I mean, we're done, right? Like, I don't need to make a degree then. We're, we're never going to win. Uh, and then they said, and it takes us about 18 months before those people are useful in a production team. And I said, why? They're really smart. Like, what's going on? And I said, they can't work with artists, they can't work with designers, they can't work with musicians, they can't really even work with each other. Uh, they just tend to know a lot about how to code things. And I went, being you know, much younger and more naive, I said, well, I think we could do better than that, right? Um, and so we designed a, a degree that was essentially asking people to do a little bit of everything, right? So you were gonna take a little art and you might not be good at it. You were gonna take a little code and you might not be good at it, and a little design and a little this and a little that, and so on, so that everybody had enough 
of something that they could start to generate some empathy and some understanding for both how the whole process worked and how other people were responsible for working within it. And then they would go off and they would specialize for a while in the thing that was their passion, right? Be it you know being a dev, being a, a designer, being a game artist, or whatever. And then they would come back together and start building ever more complex things throughout that curriculum. Right? It's, it's a fairly tried and true model of curricular design. It's not, I think, rocket science. Um, but doing that within the confines of a college of computing and information science at RIT was tricky, um, both politically as well as just functionally. Um, and right away, we started doing some, some weird things. Uh, so I, I worked very hard on a project for a number of years called Muppets, um, which was a collaborative virtual environment for learning how to program. So we started teaching our introductory programming courses in a game engine that we were developing in the senior year. And we did that for a couple of reasons. One was just to connect the seniors with the freshmen. So the seniors really started to care about freshmen learning to program because they were using their tool. Right? So there's an investment there. And the other reason we did it uh, was because we wanted to do, have enough scaffolding and tooling. Remember, this is like pre-Unity. Like, that stuff didn't exist yet. So we wanted to have enough scaffolding and engagement where anybody that came into the program their very first year, they were gonna, we made sure that they built a game. Because I don't think you can say to an 18-year-old, you're going to go to college to learn how to build games and then not build one for three years. It just doesn't kind of ring true. Uh, we did a games layer of sort of gamifying the experience of being an undergraduate student so you could get a po a points and achievements and badges and compete for things and there were scavenger hunts and all that kind of stuff and they were really silly, right? They were like, you know, find the department chair's office and, you know, have, co have a free cup of coffee, right? Or um, we had one where there was a, a midnight scavenger hunt that ran you all around the university because enrollment, uh, and, enrollment and retention would tell us that students would largely drop out of school if they didn't know where the resource offices were on campus, so we dragged them through all the resource offices by playing a game, um, stuff like that. Uh, that was kind of fun. It funded my Microsoft. Uh, kind of neat. Whew. So <clears throat> that was then, right? These were things that we were doing in early to mid 2000s, trying to make a games program, trying to make it, you know, credible, etc. Um, and it wound up being very credible. Right? So it's ranked in the top five pretty much every year, um, so on and so forth. But what's interesting to me is, so we started, and when we started, no one would play with us. Right? So like, we were like, we need some art, because otherwise you make really ugly games. And we went to the art department, and the art department was like, we don't do games. Right? And we need some, like, you know, as fun as it is to try to make games with entirely just middleware, like sometimes you really need like a deep computer science person to like, make the thing, you make that new tech that's gonna drive the experience that you're trying to do, or, or a hardware person in you know, mechanical engineering or something like that. And we would go out to them and they would say, well, we don't, we don't do games, that's not a, it's not a thing, it's not a, it's not a real thing, anyway. Um, and a couple of years ago, I gave a talk at GDC, and I, I, uh, I said, you know, well, like, that was then when we built our little school, um, what does it look like now across campus, right? Like, has anything changed? So I, you know, got out the course catalog and I looked through the Twitter feeds of everybody I know on campus and I was like, who's doing what with video games? And I tried to make a map and I mapped it out and I you know, think I did a, like an okay job, I'm sure I missed some, uh, but I tried really hard and it looked like that. So like in the intervening 12 years, that's what happened to games at our campus. Now everybody wants to do games. And games have sort of become this cultural form that folks are interested in and engaged with and trying to understand how they apply to their own domains, how they apply to education, how they apply to business, how they apply to um, science, how they, you know, so on and so forth, right? The art folks woke up and went, oh, yeah, what you really meant to ask us was, was would we do real-time animation with you, right? If you'd have used those words, we would have had a better conversation, you know, so on and so forth, right? It's sort of an interesting, way the, the, the game sort of gets amalgamated and redefined depending on which, which of these context circles you're kind of looking in. But overall, the cultural acceptance and engagement with games educationally has just exploded on this campus. And 
That's just my little campus, right? When I first started that games program, there were like maybe four or five other schools kind of developing curriculum at that scale. Uh, there was USC, there was uh, North Texas, I think Guildhall was starting to be active. There were um, you know, a couple of others. John Laird was doing his course at Michigan. And, um, you were sort of like saying things about games, but didn't really have a home <laughs> yet, right? I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, it was interesting, right? Um, now there's like 300 and some odd undergraduate programs in the United States. It's like, so it's just interesting to see. Um, and along the way, we've had some really fantastic students. Um, it's been my, my pleasure to teach them. Uh, but what I think is really interesting about that is when we started, people were like, well, nobody's actually going to get a game in jobs. Right? And it turns out that we actually graduate students that get games, get games jobs. Right? And some of them are students like this that are in the AAA industry that people kind of know and understand and hear about, right? So you've got you know, Alex at Halo or, or Claude and, and Dustin at Destiny or Sella at Xbox or Anna at Valve. And, um, you know, like these people have had incredible careers off of the degrees that they earned and you know, we can only take partial credit for that because it's mostly them being incredible people and very smart. Um, but I like to think that you know, we had some effect as they, as they came to the program. Um, but what you don't see there is you don't see a whole bunch of people that went into AA or that transitioned into mobile or that you know, work for Nickelodeon making SpongeBob games or that um, didn't go into games at all. And you know, the people ask me what the best job somebody got out of our program is. And the best job was uh, somebody has the job that um, he works for uh, National Geographic and they take him to dive sites all over the world so that he can do pre-visualization renderings um, in 3D of the underwater topography uh, so that they can take it back and plan a camera shoot so that when they make those specials of like, you know, here's the underwater path of the blah, 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 right? Like they've planned the whole route in advance off of the models that he builds. So I'm sitting in New York in February <laughs> and I get postcards to this day from that guy in like Bermuda. And I'm pretty sure he has the best job. And I, somehow I lost. Um, yeah, so these are things you can do with the game degree. So I want to transition a little bit to how I think about, I've spent the last few years teaching game production specifically. Um, and I want to transition into kind of a more deeper reflection on that work. And, but hopefully by now, um, what I'm about to say is going to ring true, because this was kind of the defining moment when I started to really think about the underpinnings of what the curriculum was that we were working with. And it's a really simple statement, but it's, it's um, one that has stuck with me forever. I was sitting on the floor at Microsoft Research Headquarters with a friend of mine named Ian Horswell at Northwestern. Um, and he, we were having a debate about how colleges work and how we structure curriculum and that kind of thing. And he said this. And he said, it's important to be protecting making as a mode of inquiry. And I looked at that and I kind of turned my head to the side and I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, a lot of times we focus so hard on research that we forget that the act of making something in and of itself is of educational value. And I kind of thought about that for a while, and I twisted that around in my head and simplified it into slogan form and came up with we learn by making things, right? which is kind of the core of construction as educational theory. Um, and it's now inscribed in very large letters on the building that I'm building uh, that will open next week. Um, and so to talk a minute about that building, and I'll come back to the learn by making things, um, so we started that effort, we started the magic effort around this idea that there was some convergence between the technology and platforms of games and media and story and film. And so you know, it's getting a little blurry about what constitutes a game versus an interactive VR experience versus a 3D movie. They, they start to share content between the two. They start to share personnel between the two and so on. Uh, and our president looked at that and went, we have all of these things working really well at RIT, but none of them talk to one another because they're in different departments and different silos and whatever. So we should just make a place that does that stuff and have all the people that do that stuff be able to affiliate with it. And then we'll be really sneaky and we'll just put all the toys there 
So anybody that wants to do anything has to like go there and they'll rub shoulders with the other people and that'll kind of drive you know, research folks to talk to one another and students to be in a shared space and meet each other and so on and so forth, right? He got really excited about it and did this really nasty thing where he took me out to lunch and he pitched the whole idea and I was like, that sounds awesome. And he waited until the end to be like, and I want you to do it. And then you're like, but I, you know, whatever. Um, so uh, I built a, a research center there. But I was more interested in convergence of another sort, which was a lot of time, a lot of times, and particularly in the program that I was in, we were thinking about. So here's the games program. Here's us teaching, you know, people that want to be game designers, game developers, game artists, what have you. And then we're doing some startup and incubation activity on campus, and that's literally like down the road. Um, for you know, like you know, go to the incubator, you know, go drive up to that stoplight and turn left. Um, and then we were doing uh, sort of student support and, and first and third party partners for folks that actually wanted to build games. And we weren't sure that those were really startup activities. It was just, if you wanted to build a game beyond like a course project, how did you actually do that? Um, and then we had research and research was like its own, you know, like, oh, well that's a thing faculty do when the students aren't around or they do with their grad students but not their undergrads and whatever. And then occasionally, and the, the purple one is the one that universities, at least my university, was so horrible about, right? It was like, you made a thing, we actually like literally just never even told anyone. Right? Like, it's just like, yeah, we made a thing, and like, you know, maybe the professor put it on Twitter, but we didn't like do anything about it, right? Um, and so I was looking at all of those things, and I was like, well, if we're doing all of these things, like, why, does, why isn't that the, the center thing? Like, why isn't that the place that all of this stuff starts to combine and get mashed up. So when I made Magic, I convinced them to make it in two halves. One was a university-wide research center that any faculty member on campus could affiliate with, and one was a studio to actually take work and polish it and send it out the door, which was intense. And I'll show some examples of that in a minute. Uh, I ran it for five years. Uh, the first year was kind of, well, the first half year was just figuring out how to pay the bills. Um, the first real year was figuring out how to support the faculty in their research because it was a new model and change takes time and so on. And the second year, we shifted to the students and tried to get them to understand that they were also welcome, both graduate and undergraduate, not just if you were so-and-so's advisee, but any student on campus was welcome to actually be a part of the center and to take part in its activities and uh, so on. And then the third year, we really got into production. The third year was like, okay, if we're gonna make things at scale, if we're gonna make real games that the university is known for, what does that look like? The fourth year, I had to remind everybody that art was important, again. <laughs> um, it seems like that would have sunk in by now, but not so much. So that was going back to the art school yet again and saying, nope, we mean it, we need you, you need us, come on. Um, and then the, the fifth year was sort of like really sort of getting people to think of it not just as this weird kitschy part of the university but as an actual production studio um, that could make media on its own. Um, so it started in that little round building there uh, which is about 12,000 square feet. Uh, that's the building that we, that's the architectural rendering of the building that will actually, it's open already, you can walk around it, I should have grabbed a real picture. Um, but it will officially open uh, next week. Uh, and we did a lot of stuff in it. Um, basically a lot of different funding streams, a lot of different activities, uh, from large scale grants to small scale grants, from the 30 million we raised to actually make the building in public-private partnership to small things around uh, grant designations and, and initiatives and speaker series and supporting different people's academic projects. And that meant working with the office of the president and the provost and community relations and development and alumni and this and that and the other. And it all got really, really, really complex because we had to deal with intellectual property and, and course management and um, hackathons and app challenges and uh, all the conferences that we went to and all of the network support and all the managing all the relationships and yada, yada, yada. And it was like kind of exhausting uh, and kind of insane. Um, and we never really did anything the same way twice because each little project that we did was a tiny little snowflake that needed different things at different times. 
And so I can sum all of that up by saying, really, the M is for mess. So hopefully you get a sense of the chaos that went into engaging with that stuff. Right? And to talk a little bit about the things that we made, uh, the first game that we made, I made specifically for two reasons. One is I wanted to teach the university about making things at scale um, and making things that were visible. And the second thing I wanted to do was challenge everyone's assumptions of what a game was. So I made a game called Splatter Shmup, splatter being the thing that happens to paint when you drop it, and shmup being a contractualized form for shoot 'em up, which was slang for a certain type of arcade game in the 80s where you ran around and shot stuff in 2D. And the game taught us a lot of things about production and scale. I had 14, 14 students work with me on this game for a semester. And then I spent about another two months on my own cleaning up what they had done and polishing it and um, making it you know, sort of rock solid in terms of being a piece of software. Um, it's a, well, I'll show you in a minute. Um, it is a game that was written in HTML. It's a web page, which challenged everyone's assumptions about how game technology was supposed to work. Uh, it was a finalist at, at GLS. Uh, it was accepted at DIGRA, at Blank Arcade, at IndieCade, um, or Indie Arcade. And probably its biggest claim to fame was I showed it on the floor of the Smithsonian American Museum of Art. Um, so I got to stand in the art place next to the real thing and call my mom and say, Mom, I made an art game about art, and I'm in the art place, and I, I think I win. Right? Like, I, yeah. Right? And I say it's an art game because it's a game about gesturalized abstraction. It's a game about Jackson Pollock. Right? It's a game about what it looks like, what it feels like in form and space to think of a canvas as an arena, which is are the words that he uses when he's interviewed, which is interesting. Um, and you play it, and you play it as a shooter because things are coming at you and you have to avoid them and all of this. And you make a painting. So these are paintings that people made by playing this game. And that's my little class that made it. And that's the game in action. And uh, some logos and things. Uh, and what I would say about it at this point is um, it seems to work. We just presented it Meaningful Play. We've now had a couple of years, and we've seen it adopted into um, fourth to sixth grade art education classrooms. Um, so you can give this to little kids, and they suddenly paint different Jackson Pollock paintings. Give them a stick and ask them to make one before and after. It's kind of interesting. Um, they start to pick up the vocabulary that's embedded within the game around form and space and line and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, so it's kind of fun. So that was our first game. It's a strange game. It's not a game that most people would think of when, they, when you hear, go make a video game. Um, you don't think of that. And so that's what we wanted, but we also wanted something that was big enough to make a big enough splash that the entire campus kind of went, oh. That's a thing. And when we showed it on the Smithsonian and it hit the local news, like people were like, okay, that's a that's weird, right? <laughs> people were talking about it. Uh, the next game I made, I made to um, sort of play off of that, but also to uh, challenge people's assumptions around what the production level that uh, a college could get out of, out of, coll out of collegiate work. Um, <clears throat> and interestingly enough, I made it about the university. I made a game about campus politics. <laughs> it's called Hack Slash and Backstab. <laughs> and it's a game about a broken mechanic. Right? It's a game about needing a team in order to survive a game. But when you get to the end, only one person wins. It's literally a game where you have to run through an environment, and all four of you need to work together in order to get there. But at the end, the first person through the door wins. And so after you play it once, you go, OK, what's the optimal time strategy for when I stab the other person in the back and run through the door? <laughs> and you wind up playing round after round of it. It's a pretty quick game. You can play it in four or five minutes. So you play it, and then you play it again, you play it again, you play it again. And over time, you no longer like the people that you're playing with. And what's interesting about that is that it was a reflective piece on things like stack rank. So when you have a department that needs to work together in order to succeed, but you evaluate everyone individually, and you do things like you must average a three 
across these people, right? And everyone gets an individual score one to five, right? That is not conducive for the long-term promotion of group work. Look at the psychology of it. Right? Um, if you're ever on a group project as a student, right? And somebody says, well, you know, it's a group project. You all have to work together or to turn it in. I will grade you individually. Some of you will be better than others. Right? And you start to think right at the end, hmm, it doesn't feel good. Right? It's a game about that. And so we gave it cartoon characters and, you know, funny little glowing knives and all this kind of stuff. But it's actually a pretty dark game. Right? Um, and it was kind of a reflective piece. The other interesting thing about that game is that we actually finished it out and polished it up and launched it on the Xbox One. So all the students that graduated that particular experience had a title credit on a shipping Xbox One game. You can go buy it on, on Xbox Live. Right? Um, so it's kind of an interesting piece to take something at that scale to deal with the production requirements of engineering in that way um, to kind of really get at it. Uh, the third piece we did was not a game at all. Um, it was a VR experience, so we used game technology for not games. Um, but our client was the Buffalo Bills, which are arguably an NFL team. <laughs> um, and it was a really simple, um, it's a really simple app, right? It's designed to just give you a little bit of a taste of what, it, what it's like to be a player on game day. So it shows you the locker room and running through the tunnel and you know, having to wait around for the press corps and like all this stuff that we don't think about. We just think about when they're on the field. Um, so it's for this kind of the super fan that wants to experience what that looks like. Um, but it meant having the NFL as a client for the university, which is a really fun to talk to general counsel about having the NFL as a client <laughs> for the university, right? Like that goes a little cockeyed. Um, so we were trying to prove capability and prove scale. Uh, the game I'm working on now is a game called Fragile Equilibrium. Um, it's probably the prettiest thing we've made yet. Um, I'm spending a lot of time in, in Artland uh, on it. Uh, it's a pretty traditional side-scrolling shooter, except anything that gets by you breaks the other side of the screen. And so it eats its way back, because you're no longer able to get out of the playable area. So it squeezes you. And it's a visual allegory of what it means to feel, how you feel when you suffer from depression. So if the world is coming at you from the right, as it does in a scrolling game, right, you can turn around and deal internally with putting the pieces back together on the left. But when you do that, the world is still coming at you. Right? And so you have to find a way to strike a balance to move back and forth between internal and external uh, activity, between uh, sort of you know, engagement with the world and self-reflection, et cetera, um, and walk a line uh, in an ever-tightening environment um, to, to survive, right? So it's a game about feeling very squeezed. Um, and we wrote that up as an artist statement. Um, we've got a couple of slides in here of just, um, you know, sort of like, this is kind of like what the work looks like to try to get to a game with that visual aesthetic. Uh, it's kind of a difficult thing. These are some of the tools that are involved in, in some of that. Um, and then the one I want to kind of spend a little bit of time on is, uh, you don't build something like that in a bunch of little, you know, hour and 10 minute sessions for an undergraduate class or an hour and 40 minute sessions for a graduate class. Like it just, it doesn't happen, right? So we've had to develop kind of a communications infrastructure and a tasking infrastructure and a process for the way that the folks that I'm working with can work that is distributed, that is kind of always on, et cetera. So we're all on Slack together. Uh, we all use Google Drive as a kind of shared repository because that the campus bought my campus bought into Google as its kind of way of doing that. Um, we track everything on Trello, uh, so we're kind of mimicking the software development environments that folks would see in industry. We use Jira for task tracking. We use GitHub for source control. Um, so we're kind of mirroring what folks would see when they're doing this kind of work professionally at a, at a maybe half scale. Uh, within kind of the stuff that we're that we're doing, um, so those were my games. I don't want to pretend that my games were the only thing that were happening in and around the, the center. Um, we've done a lot of of things. Um, probably done about 35 projects, give or take, of various size. 
um, some of them digital, a few of them not, et cetera. Uh, so kind of five years of, of walking through that. And when I think about that, the big problems that we're trying to solve, none of them are really technical, right? We're trying to solve communications problems because things get, uh, pardon the pun and the movie joke, lost in translation between all the different disparate teams and parts of making something complex like a game, right? Um, the formal and informal learning, not just skills applied to complex practice, right? Um, or not just skills, but skills applied to complex practice, right? Um, skills in, situ in situated learning in context, right? So being able to actually make the thing, right? as a reflective act to know that you have the skills to make the thing. Uh, the cultural development and capability, right? So where do games come from? How, do they, how can you repeatably have a design process that will winnow down to good ideas? Um, how do studios work, right? And what's the student level of maturity and palate for the form and function of the media that they're trying to make, right? So when I first meet with a lot of our undergrad, my undergraduate students at, at RIT, they will say things like, you know, I really like first person shooters, so I'm gonna make first person shooters. And I'm like, what else have you played? And usually the answer is nothing, right? You know, and I'm like, you, you're not, you're not, you don't even know, right? Like, just, let's just explore games broadly and what that looks like. Let's explore the definition of gamer broadly and think about why gamer is kind of a loaded term in the first place. Like, let's explore who is, who is playing and why are they playing? And what are their motivations for playing? And so on, right? And so, um, yeah, that, right? And academic immersion, right? So creating this kind of shared cultural context and sp working space between all of these different lenses that we call fields, right? So between computing and art and informatics and information technology and HCI and this and that and the other, right? And digital humanities and you know all the ones that keep cropping up. Um, how do you create a space inside of there where people can have enough comfort to actually do real work? Right? That's been, I think, the passion behind what I've been doing for, for a while. Um, so the core design principle of the building that we made um, was that no space should be used for only one thing or by one constituency. So the minute that you have to share your home, you're going to learn about the people that you live with. Right? It's pretty simple. <laughs> Um, and so our commitment to that was multi and cross disciplinary work should extend to the actual physical design of the building. Uh, it should extend to the technology selection, to the administration of it, to the operations of it, um, to the culture and to the community. So things like you know, shared scheduling practices across the colleges, things like um, you know, shared resourcing and login between all the different programs and researchers that were engaged with the building. Um, you know, going to multiple constituencies when you had a piece of technology to be selected and saying, will this work for you? Well, will it work for you? And which pieces of it will work for you? And so on. Um, it meant that we didn't always act as quickly as folks would like us to, but hopefully more thoughtfully um, in trying to, to build at scale something to support a broad and deep context of what that looked like. So I was trying to build a particle accelerator for the happy accident. Um, if you just cram all the smart people in a space and give them all the toys, I'm pretty sure that good things will happen. And uh, model a little bit for our students about how collaboration and teams work. And so we were doing that and we were trying to tell that story and we were trying to tell that story a lot because you need to hear it enough that you start to actually, it becomes a part of your own process, right? And so one of the things that I think I probably got a little bit in trouble for uh, was we told that story and we told it, and we told it. And I worked with University News to tell it again and again. So over the five years, we had a few news articles. <laughs> um, because we were really trying to change the way people worked on campus. And we would do things, a few things, that weren't just about research, that weren't just about, um, they weren't just about building, right? They were about reflecting on the importance of what we were building and the cultural impact of the kinds of work that we were doing. Um, this is probably the highest profile one. We, we built a computer uh, for Riley. Riley um, was a Make-A-Wish kid. And not only did we build him a computer, but then we themed all the wallpapers from all his favorite games. Uh, the students all created gamer tags so that they could play with him for a little while and get him kind of up and going on the new hardware that he had available and that stuff. We had somebody that would 
volunteer to be tech support for him on the other end of the, of the chat for a while, um, and so on and so forth. And we brought him out to Rochester in the Make-A-Wish limousine, and we got to open all the stuff, and, and then we, we created an experience for him to go to the Museum of Play and see all of the original design notes from a bunch of famous video games, and tour the thing behind the scenes, and all that kind of stuff. So we had a really awesome, I think, um, day. He seemed to really like it. Um, but that also kind of, we use that as a reflective moment to talk to the campus about the fact that games are culturally important, right? even if they're not your thing. Right? So we were doing this work, and you know, why is a research center doing this work? Right? There's no ostensible, we don't get anything from this work, there's no ostensible funding attached to it or whatever. Right? It's just an important thing to do when you're part of a community of practice, right? and you're the person that bears responsibility for speaking for the institute that you know, games are a cultural form of importance. So there we were, Mitch Riley. Um, we also did things like specifically engineered events. Um, so we're responsible for doing a couple of hackathons on campus, so we made one that was specifically um, not a hackathon, because hackathon is a loaded term, and certain people are drawn to it, and certain people hate it. Um, I'm on the hate it camp. Um, so we created a create-a-thon. And we specifically made it a create-a-thon because we were reaching out to the art department uh, and we wanted people to have kind of more of that aesthetic. And we specifically created all of the marketing materials and all that stuff so that it wasn't just about code, it wasn't just about hacking, it wasn't just about you know, time solutions to things. Um, we very specifically said you are not welcome to stay for 24 hours. Right? You should go home and sleep like a human being. Right? Um, you know, we got good food. We did all of that kind of stuff. Um, and it was probably the most successful one that we ever did. And it was the most diverse one that we ever did. Uh, I think because we were trying to bridge some particular communities on campus and really thought about uh, who we were inviting and what their motivations were and why they were doing what they're doing. Um, so a little bit about future work. Um, right now, I'm I'm doing this thing where I'm kind of rethinking what apprenticeship means. So when I built that Splattershmup game, uh, this was the first place I showed it. This is the lobby of the Marriott Motel in Los Angeles, and it was not ready to show. Um, and the, the guy in the gray shirt is the senior vice president for experience design at Adobe, so he knows a little bit about drawing software. Um, and the guy next to him is Jeff Dowd, who is the principal designer at Adobe, who definitely knows about uh, drawing <laughs> software. And we were talking about line and form and function and all this kind of stuff. And um, it was kind of interesting uh, to talk with them about their, their vision of how people <coughs> use computers for art and this stuff. And um, Michael kind of went off about the way that people learn to draw and, and the stages that people learn to draw in and, and how someone develops as an artist and starts to develop the cultural identity of thinking of themselves as an artist. And so what's interesting about that is, um, so like when you think about little kids, little kids draw almost universally. There are some cultural differences in different parts of the world, but it, for American children, most American children draw. We give them crayons and you know all that kind of thing. And at first it starts out, you know, it's very kinematic, right? It's like you know I'm learning to use my arm by scribbling this thing around and you know, what have you. And later on, objects start to appear, and uh, you'll transition from you know single objects to multiple objects and start to construct a scene and then you know you start to you know get into rudimentary you know shading and light and you start to get into um, introductory perspective and so on there are all of these stages you can almost identify them I didn't put the map in here but you can identify them almost by age right um, and they vary a little bit you know year to year but but by and large um, if somebody continues to draw and people drop off at different points when they just sort of like stop engaging with drawing. And one of the breakpoints is when they start to um, get what we would term feedback on their work. And this is sort of interesting. So um, most little kids think they're really good at drawing. Right? Think of a little kid, right? Where you're like, you know, I'm awesome, right? They're kind of awesome at everything, but they're also awesome at drawing. Right? And so someone will, they'll be working on, say, like a cloud. Right? And they'll you know, make this big white puffy cloud, and it's going to be on this sky that's kind of like blue, green, and twinkly, and you know, right? like, it's going to be you know, it's just this wonderful little peaceful scene, and they're excited about it, and all this kind of stuff. And the, the well-meaning adult 
you know, that is not really paying attention, kind of walks by it and goes, you know, hey man, like, nice sheep. Right? And so somebody has to start to deal with the fact that what they had in their head in the cultural, in the context of what the work that they're making is, was not conveyed. Right? And that's one of the first big hurdles that somebody has to get over in order to continue to think of themselves as an artist. Right? It's dealing with interjections into the, pro the construction, constructive process of their work. And if you watch like 12 year olds draw, most of them cover their paper. Interesting. So I started thinking about the way we teach game design. And I looked at some co uh, John Banks' work on, on co-creativity, and Casey O'Donnell's work on game talk and acculturation in the game development process. Uh, and I started looking at live streaming. And you know, TL is out there talking about live streaming. Um, you know, the, this paper on, uh, on, on Twitch and fostering participatory communities. Uh, and I started to really kind of dig in a little bit, right? I mean, this is new work that I'm doing, so it's about, so I've been at it for about six months. Um, but I'm starting to really look at um, how people are participating in streaming, not streaming playing a game, streaming in making one, streaming development, streaming design, streaming art creation, et cetera. Um, and I did this little thing uh, with, with Mia, I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, that I would refer to as the tale of the two atoms. Uh, so we, f we were watching a bunch of streams and we just happened to pick two that both of the participants were named Adam, uh, although one of them on, on Twitch is going by Cluade. Um, so there's, there's programmer Adam and artist Adam, and there they are in their, in their Twitch environments, um, stream environments. But <coughs> starting to think about, so Coder Adam is doing a lot of things that I would love, uh, I've been trying to get people to do in my classroom like forever. Right? They're doing talk a lot of protocols. Well, I'm trying to do the following, and I'm thinking about it this way, like as he's writing the code, right? And you know, like stubbing it out in comments beforehand, like like really cognitively reflecting on the thing that he's doing. And I'm like, no way, right? Are you only doing this because you're streaming it? Like what? <laughs> you know, um, really careful attention to the folks that are talking to him in chat. A lot of things are happening in the chat around what are you trying to do? Um, here's a, here's a suggestion on a way to do it. Um, he'll ask questions, his participants will ask questions, they'll try to answer each other, folks, pokes, folks will start posting links to other information about how to do this stuff. So they're creating this little, um, this little bit of co shared community around the study of how to construct games in a, in a development context. Right? And um, so I'm looking at that. Uh, one of the reasons that they will tell you that they stream is just so that they have a reason to engage with the activity every day so they don't get lazy. Um, they don't start, you know, like it keeps them honest, uh, is, is a lot of, of that. Um, and they're really not after a lot of the things that we think about when we think about uh, streaming, right? They're not after Twitch status, right? They're not after attracting a, you know, a, a massive following or try to, uh, you read the rhetoric, right? And it's like, well, I'm going to stream the development of it in order to fund the development of the game. And that does not work, right? <laughs> and, and they're not really trying to do that underneath the hood when you talk to them. Um, artist Adam was very differently, was very different, right? It was sort of a visual constant reflection on the thing that you're watching him build up this piece, right? But he specifically says in the chat, like, I don't want your feedback while I'm working on it, right? We will discuss it when it's done. I don't want people interjecting their thoughts in while I'm trying to do this, and he, he hides the window and won't, won't engage. Um, but again, streams is commitment to practice. Uh, again, small community. Um, but the art thing about cultivation of a number of people looking at your work, right, is really important, right? Developing a following and getting feedback for finished pieces is critical for any practicing artist. So there are some similarities and some differences. And so I've been thinking about that, thinking about development streaming, and thinking about the way that we engage with games. Um, so when I teach games, historically, I do the same thing that a lot of my colleagues do, which is I demo a couple of things, you see some process, I try to convey some skills, and then I actually go away and make one, right, and then bring it back and try to deconstruct from the thing that you brought back whether or not you mastered those skills and whether or not that's working for you, right? If I was gonna teach you how to throw clay, I would throw a bunch of clay on the table. First, I would, you know, I would do it for a little while and let you see, 
And then I would kind of hold your hands to get the feel into your hands of how this works. And then I would watch you do it a whole bunch. And then I would say, go away and throw like, you know, 500 you know, little cups until you really master like how it's supposed to, to gel. <coughs> so there's that co-participatory apprenticeship. And I'm curious to the extent that streaming is, is a platform where some of that can be brought back into the educational models of the way that we think about digital media creation. Um, and then it becomes kind of weirdly reflective because it's also a distribution mechanism for the same media that we're creating. Um, so it's kind of interesting that way. If you're really into that, um, I am working with uh, Mia Consalvo, who's the Canadian Games Research Chair on that. Um, and we're just starting to put some stuff out about it now. And uh, there will be hopefully a lot more in the future. Uh, the other thing I'm doing is I'm doing art every day and moving it into VR to kind of get at how, um, uh, how we think about gallery space, how we think about um, public exhibition, that kind of thing, and how technology can mediate that experience for uh, different ways. Uh, if you want to follow what I'm doing, uh, I made a website, so you can follow it there, um, andyworld.io, and that's it. Woo! Got about 10 minutes, five minutes for questions. I heard there was wine, too. There yeah. is, yes, yeah. and that will, that will facilitate the question. <laughs> So it's just an interesting thing, right? Because there's been other video platforms out there for a while. You look at Linda, you look at YouTube, um, and other other various like video services, but mm -hmm. they don't seem to have the same kind of relationship that uh, live streaming has. Right. Um, do you think it's solely because there's someone there, or are there other interactive affordances that are really kind of like making this more possible than it was as far as like uploading eight hours of me programming onto YouTube, which I'm sure people still do. I mean, I've done, I've done lots of tutorials on coding that. Yeah, so I think, I think the, the participatory aspect is really key. Um, just, I, you know, and I'm winging it here because I haven't, you know, I'm doing research actively in the space, right? I'm not speaking from a whole bunch of stuff that I've already, you know, kind of distilled. But I think the participatory aspect is really key. I think the idea of, of shared co-creative context is really key, right? Like having a group of people around you that are interested enough that they're watching what you're doing because either they're hoping to learn Right, or they're hoping to contribute, or both. Um, and so, it's it's that same sort of like you know people played, you know, people played RPGs forever, and they would trade hints and tips and tricks and you know all this other kind of stuff. But the minute you make an MMO, it's just a different, a different beast, right? And so there, that notion of having a little community of peers, I think, is very very critical. Now on the flip side, um, the search infrastructure for live stream is so broken, right? Because we don't know how to search video really all that well. We just tag it with text and then search the text but not really the video. Um, and trying to predict or understand whether or not a given stream is gonna be the right one for you is a really time consuming process. And you know, there's a lot of happenstance in how people find content. Um, so if you're looking for a tutorial about how to do one specific thing, yeah. right? YouTube's probably your best bet. Right? Um, yeah, so it's, it's a really, it's, it's, it's a really um, new and emerging space, right? I don't think there are, are solid, you know, this is how it works answers yet, but it's, it's really fascinating to me to watch what's happening there. Um, like I found this one young woman uh, that dresses up as the Overwatch characters and does oil paintings. And you're like, you are so interesting. Like, why are you doing this? <laughs> but also, rock on. Like, it's just, you know. Um, and she has all these people following her, and she's doing, like, Bob Ross style. Like, this is how you, you know, right? I know that there was a blacksmith at one point, too. Yeah, I, there's all kinds of things, right? I found another, uh, I found this kid in Brooklyn that was just watching live streams of farming. Because he was convinced. And this is another thing, I didn't mention this. So the, the, the idea of authenticity right, out of live streaming is so critical um, because he's convinced that like anything that he watches about what farming is, like that is, you know, produced, right, is gonna lie, right? But if you just watch somebody farm, you can't really argue with it in his mind. I mean, I, actually you probably can manipulate the heck out of it. It's video on the internet, but, um, 
you know, I was just at the Adobe conference. I saw all the ways that you could manipulate video on the internet. But nonetheless, right, like that, that idea of authenticity, um, there's something about the feel of it that's, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Are there any ways to figure out what kind of effects streaming or other kinds of media have on the audience? Because you talked about how uh, it was the creators and broadcasters on this, but are people actually doing things because of streaming? Do they, do they get inspired? Or how do you know? Because it feels like it's kind of like you know, the participatory is not actually giving them any kind of feedback besides like some comments. Or, yeah. yeah, I mean, on the one hand, you can watch people change their their live behavior based off the comments they get, right? So you know, you can say like you know, some some programmer is thinking about it this way, right? And then has a discussion in the chat and comes back to it and goes, oh, well, I, you know. Like I'm going to change my focus or my approach, right? Or, um, you know, somebody could say to you know one of the one of the art folks, like you know, you need to, uh, you know, like this is a good thing. This is a you know, but you you know, like the anatomy. You need to go take an anatomy course on you know how to draw the human hand or whatever because like this and this and this just don't like work for me in the way that I read the work and that kind of stuff. And so you'll see stuff like that where people will change their behavior. Um, I will say there's also like a really there's emerging work that I've read that's kind of around kind of the dark side of streaming for the folks that are trying to go for it for audience. Because then they start to feel pressure to engage like every day, all the time. Um, like they make their own sweatshop and sit in it. Um, and you know, that, they get really burned out, right? And so you know, there's, there's, that happens too. Um, so I, you know, I don't want to paint this as the Pollyanna solution <laughs> to education, right? Like we've been there with games. It's not human beings are complex. Um, but I think it's kind of interesting, uh, that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder, so you, thank you so much for your talk. You um, told us so much great stuff about how you built the program um, and how you got people to collaborate and learn different skills. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you built the culture. And uh, especially if you give, give some thought to like gender balance in the program and yeah. uh, who was represented there. Yeah. Um, so, one of the first things that we dealt with culturally was a bunch of people telling us that we were going to destroy the culture, uh, which was kind of an interesting start, right? You know, people are like, you are going, you know, when, I, when we approved the games degree at the Academic Senate, uh, this guy got up, I don't know which group he was from, but he literally, he got up after the vote was taken and said, the university died here and walked out. Okay. And I'm a, I'm a junior assistant professor, I'm like... <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. <laughs> you know, like, well you know, <laughs> well done. I killed the university. Um, you know, so there was like just this big cultural disconnect around what games and media meant in the first place, right? Um, and, you know, that has obviously played, it continues to play out in issues around violence and issues around culture and issues around masculinity and issues around, you know, around communication and, and, Gamergate and that whole disaster and, and like all of that stuff, right? Things that we were doing, so when I was um, department chair, we would try to do a couple of things. One is we stripped away, um, we figured out pretty early on that the cultural narrative around the, like we were told we would have no women in our program because it was a computing program. And Right away, we figured out that was wrong just by who walked through the door. Um, but we, f we did some deep dive stuff around who was walking through the door and why. And what it was was a shift to describing what we were doing as a creative field, not so much an engineering field. I mean, obviously, it has technical stuff <coughs> in it, a lot of it. But focusing on the creative act seemed to be a broader message that folks could engage with. Um, the other thing was I was very fortunate in the group that split off from, uh, from IT to form the original School of Interactive Games and Media, uh, we had about 40% women on the faculty um, and a couple women of color, which was huge. And then I just made it the recruiting goal of like, we're just going to, you know, we're going to hopefully get that up to 50-50, but then we're just, we're going to keep it, like somehow, right, we're going to, we're going to go at that, um, which we mostly have, except for the um, some of the contingent faculty. There's just not parity anymore. Um, I wish there was. 
But then using um, the right faculty as early role models, right? So re we thought really hard about who was going to teach like freshman programming one and intro to media one, and what those what the content that those courses contained, and who they were going to see as a part of that. I went I went and taught the uh, introductory freshman seminar uh, with a good friend of mine, Eloise, um, and we both kind of like bounced back and forth um, so that folks would see and understand like here's collaboration and here are you know, role models that we can kind of look at and, and what that means. Um, a lot of role modeling was a part of it. Uh, we would bring in folks from industry and say, you know, don't believe us, talk to these people. And I would cherry pick you know, whoever was gonna say the right thing and, and all of that kind of stuff um, because we really thought hard about the messaging of, of what that looked like. Um, and then dealing with the right situations. Um, I mean, you know, we had folks uh, dealing with just about everything. You're a department chair, right? So, like, we dealt with the graduate student that broke down and wouldn't leave her room, and you know, this and that and the other, and just always trying to come at it from a from a point of view of inclusion and compassion, right? Rather than, you know, the rules say X and that's that's it, right? So that was kind of the, you know, it's, it's by no means perfect. Right? But it was, it was just a focus of, if we believe this as a faculty, which we did, um, then this is what we're going to do as a faculty, and not letting people kind of slide on that. Um, the other side was building a faculty that cared about each other, and that was, um, I was pretty famous for like wasting, wasting um, money on, like I had them all over to my house for 4th of July, did a rotating thing where I just like, you know, let's all just go to lunch, let's go to dinner, like let's whatever. I would manipulate the budgets to try to just create little social experiences between the faculty, between the faculty and the grad students, between the grad students. Um, there's only so many things you can do at scale for a large group of undergraduates, but you know, like that kind of, you know, just social engineering, right, and getting a sense of camaraderie was, was I think, very much to very helpful in what we did. All right, well there are uh, snacks and drinks. Snacks and drinks, <laughs> can't go wrong. So thank you again. Yeah.